The reading for our meditation this evening comes from Isaiah, the 22nd chapter. In that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and issue, every small vessel, from the cups to all the flagons. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way, and it will be cut down and fall, and the load that was on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. O Lord, have mercy on us. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening we consider the fifth stanza of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, thou key of David, come. And open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high. And close the path to misery. We heard mention of the key of David from our reading in Isaiah. But what it has to do with Jesus is not so immediately apparent. Now remember, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is a hymn which draws on many different Old Testament images concerning the Savior who would be born. And yet, at first glance, our reading from Isaiah doesn't seem to have anything particularly messianic about it. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah during the reign of King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Hezekiah himself was a godly and righteous king, although the same could not be said for some of those in Hezekiah's administration, which I suppose shows that the more things change, the more they stay the same. But I won't say any more about that. Before our reading, God has just condemned Shebna, who was Hezekiah's prime minister. Shebna was more concerned for his own glory than for the welfare of the people. And so he is going to be replaced. And where our reading picks up, God commends Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, He's the one who will take Shebna's place. Eliakim will be clothed in Shebna's robe and his sash and will be given his authority. Eliakim, unlike Shebna, will be a true father to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. It's at this point that we hear about the key of David. God says, I will place on Eliakim's shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Now in the scriptures, keys are the symbol of authority. Eliakim holds the key to David's house. He holds the key to the kingdom. As Hezekiah's right-hand man, what Eliakim says goes. Anything that you want from the king, you have to get from the guy with the key. Eliakim holds that key. They will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and every issue, every small vessel, from the cups to the flagons. Whatever you need, the guy that you have to go to is Eliakim. Eliakim held a position of lofty authority. Who wouldn't want that key? The key to the king's house, the key to his riches, and perhaps the better question is, so how do I apply for that job? But of course, as Christians, we know that there must be a deeper meaning concerning the key to the house of David. Jesus himself gives us that meaning. In the book of Revelation, which, by the way, we are currently studying on Sunday morning, 9.15, right here in the sanctuary, just in case you didn't know. In the book of Revelation, 
Jesus takes on the key of David for himself. In St. John's vision, Jesus appears and he says to the church in Philadelphia, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Now at one point in Judah's history, Eliakim held the key to David's earthly kingdom. He exercised authority on behalf of the earthly king, Hezekiah. But the key of Eliakim, that authority, is only a type. The key entrusted to Eliakim prefigures or points to the true key, which opens the true kingdom. Now we know who the true king is. The ultimate Davidic king is Jesus our Lord, whom the scriptures repeatedly call the son of David. And Jesus' true Davidic kingdom is not confined to Jerusalem or Judah. In fact, that kingdom began among the angels and has spread across the earth. And his kingdom is not a geopolitical phenomenon. The true kingdom does not belong to any one tribe or nationality, except, of course, the tribe which bears the name of the true king, those who are called Christians. Speaking of the name Christian, one of the other early names given to members of Jesus' kingdom, you see this repeatedly in the book of Acts, is those belonging to the way. A Christian is one who is on his way to the kingdom. He's following along the way, which is also Jesus himself. Because Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one entrance into that kingdom. And Jesus also says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he shall be saved. Jesus is the way that leads there. Jesus is the entrance into heaven itself. Jesus alone is the key. And Jesus is also the destination. When you get through that portal, Jesus and Jesus alone is the one whom you will enjoy forever once you get there. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All of our Christian life, its beginning, its journey, and its end, is all Jesus. By his cross, he won for us salvation. By his word and sacraments, he preserves us in that state of grace. And by his coming, he will usher us right into the house of David, where our journey will finally come to an end. And the same is true of the scriptures. And those include the words of Isaiah and the rest of the Old Testament. The scriptures are all Jesus, many times in hidden and unexpected ways. Even Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, the prime minister of Hezekiah, even Eliakim proclaims Jesus. Now, Eliakim is only mentioned a handful of times in the Old Testament, here in Isaiah and also in the book of 2 Kings. And yet his life and work is a testimony, however passing, of the great King of Kings and the kingdom that he opened for all who believe. Eliakim had his moment in biblical history. And though he was a good and faithful steward in Judah, he too passed away. That's how our reading ends. And that day declares the Lord of hosts, the peg, that's Eliakim, that was fastened in a secure place will give way, and it will be cut down and fall, and the load that was on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. Rulers and authorities come and go. As the prophet Job says, 
He makes nations rise and then fall. The Lord is the one who makes nations fall. Well, except for one. There is one kingdom that even if it seems to totter, will never collapse and crumble. There are citizens of this kingdom scattered throughout the world. Even here tonight, I see, we have a handful. You are members of that kingdom. And you are on the way. The way. It's the way that was prepared by the prophets. The way which took on flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary and was born in Bethlehem. It is the way of cross and death. It is the way of resurrection and life. Jesus is the way. And he is the key. He opens and none shall shut. And he shuts and none shall open. Thanks be to God. He has turned the key and he has opened the door. The door is open to you. Amen.